Hover bobberer. Yeah, another kick at the can, I guess, in explaining my differentiation between that which is provisionally real and that which is absolutely real. Um, assuming that there is such a thing as absolutely real anyway, but let's <laughs> one step at a time here. Um, it comes down to, I guess, the old jumble of matter, empty space, and um, energy um, versus all the world of forms that we see around us. I see a webcam right in front of me, and I'm presumably speaking into a webcam to communicate to you. I know where I generally assume that it's going to work, because every time I do, I get a response. Um, but have I proven that the webcam exists? No, I haven't. Now, Maya is a Hindu concept that says when uh, is something that occurs when you take the construct of your mind and you no longer assume that it's just a construct, you believe that it, it is actually real. There's where you run into the problem. Okay, uh, for the purposes of utility, I understand that this webcam exists, and if the webcam were to suddenly, before my eyes, morph into a severed human head or a bowl of stewed carrots or something like that, I think that I would be shocked seriously shocked to the point where I might need medical attention. Um, but all my experience tells me that that's not going to happen. Um, so I take it as real, because as they say in the Matrix, this world, this construct, has rules. <laughs> now just because it has rules, it doesn't mean that it's real. A game of Monopoly has rules. Um, <clears throat> But it does have rules and it is predictable. If I ignore certain things, like if I ignore the fact that when I look up into the sky, it's infinite and it goes on forever, well, I, my mind can't wrap itself around that, so when I look up, what I see is essentially a ceiling up there. Even though I know that's not what it is, but I, I play a mental trick on myself and I see a ceiling, a big blob of skyness up there, and that's it. That's Maya. Um, it's when you actually forget about the fact that you're accepting things as provisionally real according to the rule book and you're assuming that it is absolutely real and just end of story not just real for the purposes of utility and your own I guess predictability and adherence to the rules of life but real in an absolute sense um, that's Maya if you ask me it's when you make the transition from provisionally real to real um, my favorite quote on in that subject, I don't know if Picasso ever had anything to do with this, with the idea of Maya, but he said, if you want to understand Cubist painting and you want to be a Cubist painter, paint what you know is there, not what your eyes tell you is there. And that's, I think, the differentiation. We know that what we see is just a biased image of what's actually there. Um, and he's saying, paint what's really there, which is kind of paradoxical, because when you paint something, you're appealing to someone's senses, their eyes. You're trying to say, use your eyes to see what your eyes can't really see. Uh, there is, you know, that's the thing about abstract painting, or even extreme abstract painting. Um, it, it's deliberately being paradoxical. So that's what I see uh, as the issue here. Um, forgetting the fact that what you're looking at, or what you're doing, is projecting your own expectations onto something, forgetting that you're actually doing that. It's not that I'm saying that people should walk around assuming that a can of chickpeas is a can of coconut milk. I'm not telling people to actually live their lives that way, but you can go too far in that direction as well, though. You can go too far if you just sort of say reality doesn't exist, and then you step in, step in front of a, you know, a speeding bus, kapoof, well, <laughs> reality had something to do object to in that statement, didn't it? But by the same token, <clears throat> um, you can go too far in assuming that um, what you take as real is real. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but my favorite example of somebody who does this, or it looks to me as though this is what's happening, this is just my projection probably, but again, maybe people will catch on to what I'm referring to. Um, <clears throat> in Mendham takes guilt as something that is phenomenally real. It looks that way to me. <clears throat> he argues it with extreme um, vociferousness, and 
he bludgeons people and himself with it more or less constantly. Uh, it's something that is real, it is inevitable, and it is immutable, and it is one of the fundamental building blocks of reality itself. Rather than being something that is useful, guilt has become something absolutely immutable. Guilt, if you ask me, is something that, you know, you stub your toe and you say, all right, come on, Andy, you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, yes, and but that hurts when I stub my toe and that draws my attention to the fact that I'm doing something I shouldn't do. Fine. The way I read in Mendham, he says, that toe stubbing is reality. <laughs> uh, it's more real than anything else. And we have to, that is the fundamental thing that we have to eliminate, is the toe stubbing. Guilt, in and of itself, wins every single time, hands down, and it is absolutely invincible. Uh, that's Maya. That's when you mistake something that is provisionally real for something that is absolutely real, and you get stuck in a terrible rut where you sit there spinning your wheels, sometimes, I guess, for the rest of your life. Again, I do apologize if I'm strawmanning anybody, but I think that enough people could see where I'm, at least where I get this idea from studying what he has to say. Um, now, <clears throat> what? how do we apply this, and what difference does it make if we want to know the difference between what is provisionally real and what is absolutely real, or Maybe nothing is absolutely real. Who knows? But wh where? what about the distinction? What, what difference does it make if we're in the matrix, whether or not we actually believe in it? Like, who cares if, if this is just an illusion? It might as well be an illusion. Remember the bit about the guy chewing on the steak uh, in the movie The Matrix? He just sort of says, I don't care if this is an illusion. It tastes good. <laughs> um, that's an open question. Is it better to believe in The Matrix? Or is it better to see things accurately? Uh, or at least understand a projection for what it is? Do you really want to see what's really there? Or do you at least want more illusions dispelled? It depends on what you expect reality to do for you. If you're cool with reality, then that's fine. If you're cool with the way things are, according to, you know, this is a can of soda water, end of story, and it uh, tastes good and gives me a nice little burpy feeling, and uh, <clears throat> if that's enough for you, don't even bother. But this came up in the context of depressive realism, and we're putting value on reality itself. <laughs> is reality good or bad? That means that you have to delve a little bit deeper. You have to go deeper than you normally would. If you don't, you risk dealing with things like ethelism, running across um, things like even, I guess, religion. It's you, You're just saying that certain things are immutable. The Muslims would say there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Boom, there. That's the base rock around which everything else um, revolves. So if you stop questioning things, you end up with some sort of religion or other. Guilt is no more real than God is. Um, as Voltaire said, if God didn't exist, we would have to invent him. Well, guilt doesn't phenomenally exist, but our culture seems to require it, or our ethical system seems to require it. But if we take it to an extreme, what you get is... I know this word gets tossed around with terrible frequency these days, but uh, you get something that I would call at least nihilism. Um, that the cessation of existence is... Uh, viable and desirable goal in and of itself. Um, that's a big if. If you worship at the god of the, the altar of the god of guilt, that's what you get. Um, or in Zapfi's case, if you worship at the god at the altar of the god of horror, that's what you get. You get some sort of oh, I've run up against something that is invincible and there's no other way for me to deal with it. Well, the problem is, of course, you've constructed something that you believe is real. That can of chickpeas can be a monstrosity if you believe in it too strongly. 